Hi, yesterday I sent you a uh, recording explaining how the semester would proceed and I promised that I would send you a lecture today um, by 5 or 6 p.m. So here it goes. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we last met and the last time we were together um, we uh, finished or we started talking some about uh, I was trying to get you to the point of, of discussing um, medieval and Renaissance philosophy, which for, for the most part is going to re revolve around uh, when we're thinking of Western uh, philosophy is largely going to resolve, revolve around issues of Christianity or the topic of Christianity in one way or another. And many of the things we will discuss uh, have uh, elements of Christianity or uh, they are discussions about God. In fact, um, two of the philosophers we're going to discuss today, uh, Augustine and An Anselm, are both, uh, they're, they're both Christian and they are primarily concerned with discussions of, of, about God uh, or, or uh, theological things, if you will. And you'll remember that at, during our last class, I gave you some basics on Judaism and Christianity. Um, and so I want to just briefly review a few of those points uh, because it's, it's, it's out of Judaism that Christianity emerges. And so Christianity then becomes the, the soil out of which much of Western philosophy uh, will emerge uh, from this point forward. And so here's some of the basics of Judaism. Uh, there were Ten Commandments. About half of those commandments have everything to do with uh, an individual's relationship with God. Uh, we can call it the vertical uh, relationship. So about half of those commandments have to do with a vertical relationship between the individual and God, uh, meaning things like um, uh, thou shalt um, love the Lord thy God, um, don't take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, there is no God before uh, God, or have no gods before God. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. All of those have uh, to do with a vertical orientation between the individual and God. Uh, it is, it, Judaism is probably not the first monotheistic religion. Uh, in fact, I made the argument that it's probably henotheistic, although this is not a philosophy religion class, so we don't want to go too far down that road. But um, Zoroastrianism was probably the first monotheistic religion. In fact, Judaism probably picked up elements of Zoroastrianism uh, and incorporated those elements in, into it. Uh, nevertheless, um, it, it is known today as a monotheistic religion. Monotheistic meaning belief in one God or worship of one God. Henotheism, however, uh, is practiced by a number of Hindus. Uh, and in fact, one can make the argument that, that uh, Judaism and Christianity uh, and even Islam are actually henotheistic. Uh, that is the belief that there are other gods other gods do exist, but we choose to worship only this one God. Um, and so uh, that, that is most evident in Hinduism, where you have multiple, multiple hundreds upon thousands, even millions of gods, uh, but a, an individual might devote themselves to the particular worship of one or give their devotion to one particular god, say Ganesh or Shiva or something along those lines. But again, I've digressed here. So Judaism has at, it, at its central core ten commandments. And, and the first half of those are, are, are the vertical relationship. The second half of those have to do with a horizontal relationship. So it has to do with my relationship with you. Instead of my relationship with God, and it's just about us, me and God, 
The second part of those have to do with my relationship with you. And they're very moral in character. Uh, so to honor your parents, um, much, much like you would find in Confucianism. Um, but it also has things like don't steal, don't lie, um, don't commit adultery. Um, and that has to do with a relationship with, with the, the, the person uh, or, or people that you might meet and have an everyday encounter with. Um, a few other elements that are central to Judaism is that there are written texts. Uh, the Torah uh, becomes the central text, the guiding text of Judaism. Christianity then will pick up on elements of that and, and will, will, will advance that, uh, that written tradition as well, uh, especially first in the letters of Paul and other epistles, and then eventually the Gospels will be written. Yes, the epistles were written before the Gospels. Uh, there are some other elements uh, in Judaism that become important to Christianity, especially when we get to St. Augustine. Uh, one of those uh, elements is, is the concept of sin and the fall. Uh, now, in the book of Genesis, there, the story is told of Adam and Eve and their creation being placed in the garden, and God put all the trees there in the midst of the garden, and they were allowed to partake of any of those trees except of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, don't confuse that with an apple, because nowhere uh, is it spoken of specifically as being an apple. Uh, it, is, it is perhaps best understood as a metaphor uh, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So when you eat of that, uh, if you eat of an apple tree, it will taste like apple, and you'll understand what apples taste like. So if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will understand then what knowledge, what, what good and evil are. So the assumption is, prior to this point, uh, in, in, this, in this metaphor, Adam and Eve did not know right from wrong. They did not know good from bad. Uh, they did not know uh, good and evil. But after they consumed this, this uh, then their eyes were opened. Uh, and it's important there to take note of, of the scripture because one of the first things that they realize is that they are naked. Uh, so in this, in this, uh, in this uh, metaphor, in this allegory, our primitive parents, Adam and Eve, uh, are, 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 are discovered, or they discover themselves to be naked. And that becomes important uh, to St. Augustine later. And when I, when I get to St. Augustine in a few minutes, uh, I'll talk about that. Well, Christianity comes along at a time when the Roman Empire uh, is, is ruling the known world, or, or at least the Western world, the world all around the Mediterranean. And uh, I showed you some of that uh, in class the last time. So the countries of modern day uh, they go as far north, uh, the Roman Empire eventually goes as far north as to what we know as Great Britain today, of course, in, in France and in Spain, uh, Italy, uh, Greece, all the way across to Turkey, down through the Middle East, the, the countries of, of Jordan and Syria and what is today Israel, Egypt, all the way across North Africa. So all those countries surrounding the Mediterranean the Roman Empire has control over, uh, they're in charge of. And there are some things that, that Rome incorporates, or, or Rome does, uh, to advance their ruling of that empire. Uh, it's commonly known as the Pax Romana. Pax Romana. And so some of the elements of that are uh, that the Romans build roads. Uh, one reason for the roads uh, is so that they can quickly move. I apologize for the camera uh, jostling there a little bit. Uh, one reason for the roads is so that they can quickly move their military. Uh, they don't. Uh, they they want to be able to move their their military to uh, any corner of the empire, and so they build roads. Well, some of those roads are still in existence today. You can go to places in Europe and still find Roman roads in existence. Or, or in other cases, 
uh, the roads that the Romans built um, laid the foundation for later roads uh, that, that came along and were built over those Roman roads. So number one, uh, the Romans built exceptional roads. Uh, number two, the Romans brought government. So they divided all of this region, all of these regions that they, they were in control of, they divided them into, into provinces and they would put governors over those provinces and those governors then would also appoint leaders uh, over areas uh, much similar to how our form of government is. There's a centralized national government, then we have the states, uh, and below the states there are the counties, and below the counties there are, uh, are districts and cities and towns and things like that, uh, where you have mayors or, or supervisors or uh, freeholders or whatever it is that, that you, might, you might have at the most local uh, level. And so the Romans did a similar form of government, and everything then reported up to uh, the high central authority, the Roman government. A couple of other things uh, that are important to take note of, um, Pax Romana actually means the peace of Rome. And one of the things that the Romans brought was this overwhelming sense of peace. Now, very often this sense of peace was brought about uh, because they would be brutal to anyone who defied them, anyone who tried to, to mount any type of rebellion or insurrection. Uh, they would quickly move their military along those wonderful roads, and they would suppress any rebellion, any insurrection. Uh, that's ultimately going to be why Jesus is, is killed. Uh, they, they see him as a rabble rouser. They see him as someone who is trying to uh, trying to cause trouble. Uh, and so uh, in, in an effort to say, we just, we, we're not going to have that. Uh, don't, don't bring that shit in here. Um, the Romans eventually uh, consent and, and, and aid in his killing. Uh, remember, it is Roman soldiers who crucify Jesus and kill him. Um, so uh, peace, roads, government, now, there's one other element, the, the fourth element that I'll talk about in the Pax Romana. Uh, part of that government, I should back up and say, part of that government is that is they, they also brought, um, they developed their cities with running water and, and other things like that. Uh, it was quite advanced for, for the time. Um, but then there's one other element that to speak of, the fourth element of the Pax Romana, and, and that is the language. Now, The official language of Rome was actually Latin, but most people did not speak Latin, or they might have uh, only spoke Latin um, when they were dealing with government officials or anything like that. Prior to the Romans conquering the known world, the Greeks had ruled the known world, and the Greeks had made uh, the world literate. So Alexander the Great had brought literacy to much of the Mediterranean area and all the areas that he conquered. Uh, and as such, uh, the Romans did not have to go back and, and re-educate the people. They were already literate, uh, but they were literate in Greek, not in Latin. And so consequently, the, the language and part of the culture that the Romans then inherited when they conquered all of these lands around the Mediterranean was they inherited what is commonly known as the Hellenistic culture, uh, this Greekized culture, uh, so that people are speaking Greek, they're reading Greek, uh, and, and the world uh, understands a Greek culture. Uh, the Romans don't necessarily care for this, but they also realize, you know what, this is one thing we don't have to do. We'll build the roads, we'll put in the government, we'll uh, have irrigation systems, and we'll have running water, and all of these other things uh, will bring peace to these locations, but at least we don't have to re-educate uh, all, all, all of our citizens. And so the Pax Romana then exists of these kind of four elements. So what we have by the time that Jesus is born in around the year uh, 4 BCE, uh, we, we don't know exactly when Jesus was born, um, at some point, you know, we tried to make it year one, 
uh, there, were, there was a pope who eventually rearranged the calendar and made it year one. We know it was not in year one from various, from various uh, historical uh, things that we have access to today, um, but we don't know exactly. It could have been uh, as early as 5 or 6 BCE, uh, but most scholars put it around the year uh, 3 BCE, 3 or 4 BCE. Remember, when we're doing this uh, type of uh, measuring time, uh, B.C. to A.D., we can have 1 B.C.E., uh, we can have 1 C.E., uh, before the Common Era, Common Era, but there is no year zero. So, so um, this is one of the reasons why uh, the year 2020 is not technically the beginning of a new millennium, or, or the new decade, I'm sorry, not, not millennium, a new decade. Uh, because um, the new decade will not begin until the year 2021. Uh, that begins a decade, but because there was no year zero. All right, that's that's an aside. So it's into this world, this Pax Romana, this uh, this Jewish uh, world that Jesus uh, is born. Now we're going to set aside uh, the miraculous birth and anything about that for now. Not really going to deal with that, not really going to talk about that. What we will say is that um, the stories about Jesus' birth came along later. Um, so the earliest, earliest, earliest Christians, uh, even the disciples, they were not concerned about Jesus' birth. That was just not something that was important to them. Uh, those stories came along later. So we're not going to deal with that right now. Uh, that does become important uh, in some theology um, that, that we will discuss at some point. Maybe a little bit I'll get into it when I get into St. Augustine, but for now, uh, that's not important. We will talk about Jesus's life. Um, and so some of the things that Jesus did as he went about, uh, he supported those who were oppressed and downtrodden. Uh, we see that on multiple occasions. He worked miracles. Uh, we don't know uh, whether that, that's literal or whether that's a figurative. We don't know uh, how to understand those for our purposes in philosophy class. That's not important. That's not where we're going. Uh, we simply know from the stories that Jesus went around. Uh, he, he allied himself with those who were lowest in society, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, uh, the outcasts, the lepers. Uh, he worked with them. He healed them. Um, and, and he also taught the, the masses of people, and he taught them what, was, what is essentially a, a good moral uh, way of being, a uh, way of living your life. Uh, if, you're, if you're oppressed, if you're persecuted, well, God loves you. This was contrary to everything uh, that the religious system of, of their day was teaching them. They taught if you're poor, if you're oppressed, it means you've offended God, God doesn't love you, God doesn't care. Uh, and so uh, Jesus turned that around and said, no, no, no. Uh, God identifies with the poor, the oppressed, uh, the, the outcast. And Jesus also uh, talked about the coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, in theological terms, we refer to this as eschatology. Eschatology. Uh, E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. E-S-C-H-A-T-O-L-O-G-Y. O-L-O-G-Y, eschatology. It has to do with, with the idea of the end times, the last things, uh, the belief in or the study of the last things. And Jesus' eschatology was largely to do with the coming of the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God would be here among humanity, and it would not be some far-off place. And so Jesus was trying to encourage people to live here, in a peaceable way with each other, uh, to live in a manner with each other uh, that would be supportive of even the lowest, the most outcast of people um, in preparation for the coming of the kingdom of God. Now, as I alluded to just a moment ago, um, Jesus was considered to be a rebel rouser. And so the Roman authorities had him, um, had him killed, uh, crucified, yes, uh, they had him buried. According to the story, they stationed guards uh, to protect his tomb so that his disciples would not do anything with his body. 
lo and behold, at least the way the disciples tell the story, the way it's recorded in the Gospels, is his body did disappear from the grave, and according to the disciples, he did appear to them, and he lived and walked and talked among them uh, for roughly 40 days. And so um, the, the disciples then uh, claim to have had an encounter with a risen Christ. Uh, this is also going to lend itself to a little bit of things that we see in, uh, in, in, in later uh, philosophy theology, where uh, the physical body bad, uh, the spiritual body good. Uh, and so this, this idea that Jesus came uh, to them and, and had somehow been raised from the dead, this denial of death, then becomes central uh, to, their, to their theology. Well, after this encounter with, with, with Jesus, um, however it was, whatever it was, they sensed that, that Jesus was still with them, and they began to go out, and they began to spread uh, this message that Jesus um, was the long-looked-for look, Messiah in Judaism. Now, remember, most of the early disciples are Jews themselves, and so where are they going to teach these, these things that they're understanding? They're going to synagogues to teach them. That's where they're going to, to, to go and tell people about Jesus uh, because Jews were looking for the Messiah. And so this is where they're going to, to go tell other Jews about the Messiah. Um, and so they start getting converts uh, to early Christianity. And uh, one in particular uh, who, who is eventually converted, uh, his name is Saul. Uh, he is a persecutor, to begin with, of these early Christians. Uh, so he's trying to, to suppress them and put them down and even kill them. Uh, but he has an experience, an encounter, uh, supposedly a vision of some type uh, of Jesus. And as a result, he is converted. His name is changed to Paul. And then he becomes uh, one of the primary architects of early Christianity. And so many of his writings then... Uh, uh, fill out the New Testament. Paul's writings and some of the other writings, the epistles, um, things like Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, uh, those are written by Paul. Galatians, written by Paul. There are other books, 1st um, uh, and 2nd Peter, John, 1st uh, and 2nd John, 3rd John. Um, all of these are written by other disciples and all of these are written before the Gospels are written. It's only later that they go back and they write the Gospels. But again, this is not a philosophy religion class, not a world religions class, so we're not really concerned about that right now. So uh, all of these early Christians then begin to spread this Gospel. Now remember what I said. The Romans want peace. They don't like people causing trouble. Remember, don't bring that shit up in here. So the Romans, as a result, uh, they began to persecute the early Christians, uh, and they began to put many of them to death. Uh, we know this, we have records of this, uh, and, and you can find that, that this was a reality uh, throughout the world, throughout the, uh, the, the ancient world, that, that many of the early Christians were persecuted and put to death. Uh, the term there that we use is often martyrs. But something began to happen. And this is where we're going to pick up right now. Uh, a couple of things that I will throw, throw out here. Um, the, the, when we talk about uh, the scriptures, uh, when we talk about the Jewish scriptures, from a Christian point of view, we refer to them as the Old Testament. Um, Jews don't use that term. Um, they just refer to it as the Bible, the book. Bible means book. So the Jews refer to that as the book. Um, it, uh, and uh, it was formed, so the, 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 the chapters, also known as books, uh, within what Christians call the Old Testament, um, they were put together by the year 70 CE, uh, at a place called the Council of Jamnia in the year 70 CE. A group of rabbis got together and they decided what would be in their Bible. Uh, the Christians later, uh, around 400 years later, are going to put um, their 
their books together, uh, and that's going to form the Christian scriptures. And so the Christian scriptures that, that are put together uh, are, are going to then be matched with the Jewish scriptures to form what we know today as the Christian Bible. Now, there are different versions of the Christian Bible, but again, this is not a world religions class, not a philosophy religion, so I don't want to go into that too much, but I just wanted to throw that out there. So the early Christians were persecuted uh, by the Romans, but even in the midst of this persecution, Christianity continued to grow. It continued to spread throughout the Roman Empire. Much of the reason it spread throughout the Roman Empire was because the Pax Romana, the peace, the government, the roads, and a common language. So these elements that made for Roman society uh, and made for the Pax Romana are also the, the ground in which early Christianity begins to spread throughout the, the uh, Roman Empire around the Mediterranean world. So, um, the Romans are, are, are watching these Christians and their group began to grow and they try to suppress them. But around the year 313 CE, around the year 313, and by the way, I'm going to stop saying CE for the most part because we're into the common era now. Uh, and so it will not be as necessary to, to designate that we're in the common era. So around the year 313, uh, the emperor of the Roman Empire, uh, whose name was Constantine, converted to Christianity. So he became a Christian. And even though Christianity was a still a small percentage, Christians were a small percentage of the people within the Roman Empire, he decided to make Christianity the official religion of the empire. And so now this religion that had been suppressed uh, and had been persecuted, now they suddenly find themselves in a place of prominence, in a place of power. And Christians are going to begin to feel that power and live out that power. One of the, now I, I should say that there were a number of um, theologians who existed uh, prior to Augustine. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get into them. This is a philosophy course, so we're not really as concerned about who those uh, theologians were, but they existed, uh, and they were quite prominent. Uh, there are a number of texts that you can find, and you can read about them, uh, but we're going to pick up uh, with, with one who is known as a theologian, uh, but is also a philosopher. Uh, his name is St. Augustine. Now, Augustine's early life is kind of like a soap opera. Um, uh, okay, maybe not, but I, I'm going to use that. Um, so, Augustine um, is, uh, he loves philosophy. Uh, he really would like to give his life to, to, the, to the study of philosophy. In fact, he becomes a teacher of rhetoric. Uh, he travels around, and, and uh, he's, he's actually a schoolmaster uh, for a period of time. But he also lives kind of a loose life. Uh, he likes to party. Uh, he's especially fond of sex. Uh, he's, a, he's fond of uh, female company. And he writes about this uh, in a book. Uh, and you can, we can still find it today. It's, it's still, still around. Uh, he writes some of this in a book called The Confessions of St. Augustine. I realize it might be, might be uh, inverted or, or reversed in, in, your, in your view. It is in mine. Um, but, uh, and, and I will give you a, a couple of passages from that to read. Uh, I will post those on Canvas. So St. Augustine then um, is somebody who really loves, he loves women. His father uh, was a Roman official. Um, not high-ranking, but he was a Roman official. His mother uh, was a devout Christian. And um, she always wanted Augustine to convert to Christianity. Uh, and she had taught him Christianity from a very early age. But Augustine had just not really given it much thought 
until around the year 388. He has some type of mild uh, mystical experience. And it's at that point that he realizes that maybe there's a different way he should live his life. And so then he converts to Christianity. Um, and so he begins to study um, uh, his philosophy and try to merge it with, with Christian theology. Uh, in the year 391, he becomes a priest. In the year 396, he becomes a bishop. So he rose through the ranks very quickly uh, from the time he converted to Christianity in 388, uh, about eight years later. Um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, about eight years later, he, become, he got, becomes a bishop uh, after he's converted. So he rose very quickly. Uh, one of the uh, philosophies that uh, St. Augustine uh, adheres to uh, is Neoplatonism. Now, I realize it's been several weeks since we talked about Neoplatonism, um, but I'll remind you a little bit about what Neoplatonism is. Um, it's very much, um, um, very much like what we studied with Plato, um, and that if you'll remember the cave analogy, uh, the cave allegory, where when you're locked at the bottom of the cave, uh, and you're staring at the wall, uh, you think that's reality, uh, but as you're freed from that cave and you ascend uh, higher and higher and higher and higher out of the cave, you see the, the ones who are, who are putting on the show in front of the fire, then you go out into the sunlight and your, your eyes adjust, you see the trees and the, the people walking on, on, on land, and then eventually you look up to the sun and you realize that that is the source of reality. So uh, Neoplatonism adheres to much the same, uh, whereas for Plato, uh, the forms, uh, remember the forms? Uh, the chair is, is not really the chair. It has a chair of formness. Um, uh, the forms become the ultimate uh, for Plato. For Neoplatonism, um, the true reality is some type of mystical union with the one. Uh, and so I'm going to quickly just sketch this out here. Um, so um, so I don't know if you can see this at all. So over here you have the forms. Uh, this is for Plato. Um, this is Neoplatonism, uh, the one, uh, becomes the highest. So as you ascend this line, uh, down here are images, remember? Are shadows. Um, shadows, those things that are definitely not real, and as you ascend uh, the line and you reach the top, you will reach uh, the highest, most truest, um, reality, which for Plato it's forms, for Neoplatonism, Plotinus, uh, it is the one. He doesn't call that God. Uh, he simply refers to it as the one. Now, for Augustine, um, he's actually going to believe, then, that as you ascend that line, it is God that God is uh, the one, um, or the ultimate form, the creator of everything. Uh, for St. Augustine, that is God. So, for St. Augustine, he believes then that everything that God does, everything that God creates, is ultimately good, is ultimately perfect. Uh, it is the best it could possibly be. So then, where does evil come from? How do we get evil in the world? How could evil possibly exist? Well, for St. Augustine, um, God doesn't create evil. God doesn't create things that are bad. Uh, what happens is just like the things down here are less real, um, Augustine, uh, he's going to believe 
that these things down here are, are things that decay. Uh, so uh, it, it's almost as though the further you go back down this line, the more things decline and decay. And that then becomes the cause of evil in the world. Uh, and so of all God's creation, uh, these things down further here are the things that decay and decline. Uh, so God created the world good and perfect, but because of decay, uh, because of declension, decline, things become evil, evil in the world. Um, um, let's see, there is um, a couple of other points uh, that I want to call your attention to. Uh, and I'm going to just read um, a couple of lines uh, here so I'm talking about St. Augustine from the Oxford Companion to Philosophy. Uh, a couple of lines about, about uh, St. Augustine and, and his, his thinking. By the way, there, there was a, a, a philosopher who actually said, and I quote, uh, to study Augustine's thought as philosophy is in a sense to do violence to it. It is to isolate it. Uh, uh, it is to isolate from their purpose and context what he would have regarded as mere techniques and instruments. Uh, so in other words, uh, to, to try to look at uh, Augustine as just pure philosophy is, is to do an injustice to him. Uh, he is a, a theologian, uh, and so we have to understand it and give him uh, appreciation as a theologian, uh, but also as a philosopher, but you know, more so as a theologian. So uh, back, back to the Oxford Companion to Philosophy, reading a little bit about uh, uh, Augustine. Uh, he could believe that there were three natures or kinds of substance. So three kinds of substance, according to St. Augustine. Bodies mutable. Mutable means changeable. Uh, M-U-T-A-B-L-E. Uh, to mutate something means to change it. So bodies, so the three substances, bodies mutable, changeable in time and place. That's number one. Souls, incorporeal, but mutable in time. So souls, um, real souls, but that they can be changed. Uh, within time. And then the third substance is God. And God is incorporeal and immutable. So um, God does not change, then, is essentially it. God makes everything, and all that he makes is good. Badness arises from the tendency of things to decay. So things decline, things decay, and that's where bad and evil comes from, according to St. Augustine. Uh, just, just, just another, another uh, piece of a paragraph here. Like Plato, forms of the good, Augustine's God is not only the cause of things being, but the cause of our knowing them. So God gives us the knowledge of the things that are. God illumines truths or illuminates truth as the sun illuminates visible things. Again, remember Plato's allegory of the cave. The sun becomes the source of reality because it shines upon everything, opening our eyes. And so reality then becomes something that is far above that we can't touch, that, that we can't put our hands on. For Augustine, that is God. God then illumines everything for us to see it. But understanding, which is the actualization of knowledge, can be compared to vision as the successful exercise, like successful looking, of the faculty of reason, which is like sight, in the presence of God, or wisdom, which is like light. Uh, and that's from uh, one of Augustine's uh, writings uh, there. So for, for Augustine, uh, everything then below God, changes, changes over time, uh, and ultimately 
uh, I, I think in, in physics, uh, astrophysics, they, they refer to it as entropy. Uh, so as things move, they decay. Um, and so as a result, uh, that causes badness or evil in the world. Um, so to continue, continue on uh, with Augustine, um, we're, I'm going to point you to some things in your textbook here, uh, and then we'll depart from the textbook on a, on a few things. So if you're in your textbook, if you look on page uh, 117 uh, under the chapter of Augustine, uh, I'm not really going to talk about some of the things that he dealt with and, and some of the heresies that he tried to combat. But I do want you to understand a couple of things about um, Augustine's um, philosophy, uh, because they, they do still have relevance today in, uh, for a number of reasons. So the first thing is with regard to uh, time. So St. Augustine tackled the idea of time, and one of the readings that I'm going to, I'm going to scan and give you uh, is about St. Augustine's uh, understanding of time. Uh, St. Augustine believed uh, that time is a human creation. So we create time. Uh, we create clocks and try to measure the days, the seasons, the hours, the minutes, the seconds. That's something that, that we concern ourselves with. Um, that's very much human. For Augustine, he didn't believe God cared about time. In fact, he believed that because God is the ultimate source of everything, God exists outside of time, and Augustine referred to God as being always present. So, whereas we think of terms of yesterday, today, and tomorrow, for God, there is always and only today, now, right this moment. There is no uh, past, there is no future, there is only the eternal now. And that's why he, call, he, he that's how he explained God as being eternal, uh, uh, without time. Um, that then would be the distinction, uh, if, you, if you'd like to, to think of it this way, uh, that's the distinction uh, between humanity being mortal and made immortal because we do have a, an expiration date, if you will, and we're made, um, in, in, the, in the Christian sense and in the Jewish sense, we're made immortal uh, by God so that we're mortal as long as we're alive and then we die, but then God makes us immortal uh, after we die. Um, however you want to say that we continue to live uh, is up to you and your theology, but that's why we're mortal and then immortal. God, however, is not subject to that. God is eternal. God always is. Um, again, for God, there is no yesterday, today, and tomorrow. There is always and only today. In fact, there is always only now for God in Augustine's theology. Uh, and you can see a brief statement about that on page on the bottom of page 117. The second thing that's, that's important to understand about uh, St. Augustine has to do with free will. Now, for, for St. Augustine, uh, God does know uh, what we call the future. God does have foreknowledge. Uh, if you think about it, God is looking down, uh, and God sees everything across the expanse of time. Time is only what we know it as. So for God, as God is looking down upon it, it's all just one continuum for God. So for God to look back 5,000 years, God to look 5,000 years into the future, it's just, it's just to look there. It's all just out in front of God. Um, and so, um, so God does have what we would call foreknowledge. God does know what we would uh, conceive of as the future because God sees it all as presently now. But for Augustine... He did not uh, believe that just because God knows what the future, future as we understand future, just because God knows what the future will entail, what will happen in what we call the future, does not 
mean that God causes the future. And again, if you look on page uh, 17, bottom of page 17, beginning on top of page 18, uh, he explains this. Uh, he says, Augustine believed that freedom is the capacity to do what one wants, and one can do what one wants, even if God or anyone else already knows what the person wants. Um, Augustine pointed out that God's foreknowledge of a, of a decision doesn't cause the decision any more than my own acts are caused by my knowledge of what I'm going uh, to do. In other words, um, I could know that, um, that my wife is going to the store, but just because I know that doesn't mean that I'm causing her to go to the store. Uh, her free will allows her to go to the store. Uh, I can know that my cat is going to take a nap on, on the bed. Uh, it's what she does every day. Uh, but, but just because I know that doesn't cause her to get on the bed. So for Augustine, for God to know um, what we call the future doesn't mean that God is necessarily causing uh, things to happen uh, in that future. Um, that's, that's not what he believed. Now, the final thing that I want to get into um, here in talking about uh, Augustine, finish this one up, is the idea of original sin. Now, you'll remember that earlier um, when I was talking about Judaism and the, the uh, concept of the fall, I mentioned um, uh, Adam and Eve and, on, and all that happened there. And I said one of the important things uh, to take note of is they realized that they were naked. Now, what I'm telling you now is not in your textbook, um, but it is something that I do feel like you need to understand about St. Augustine um, because many of you were raised um, in, in the Christian tradition. Uh, you might have been raised uh, as Roman Catholic especially. Uh, there are other uh, Christian traditions that also have an understanding of what we know as original sin. So, excuse me, before, oh, my chair's rolling away. So for St. Augustine, as he, as he thought about this concept of evil and such, um, remember that for him, uh, where did I put my, uh, oh, here it is, uh, my, my line. So for Augustine, uh, Everything is perfect. So for Augustine, this is creation. He believed in a literal creation. And this is where it starts right here. And then everything declines as it goes down this line from here. Uh, the aspiration then is to have less decay, less declension. Uh, and the less you decline, uh, the closer you are from God. So the very fact that we refer to Adam and Eve's um, sin in the beginning of the story of the Bible uh, as the fall means that they went from this state of perfection up here near God to somewhere down here along this line. They fell from this state of perfection down here in Augustine's uh, philosophy and Augustine's theology. It becomes important to, August, to, to Augustine to try to reconcile some of his own appetites, his own desires, his own passions with his theology. Now remember I said at the very beginning talking about St. Augustine that he was very much uh, a womanizer. He liked sex of his own admission. Um, we don't know how much that is, and we don't, you know, we, we don't have all the details, but of his own admission, uh, he, that, that was kind of the way he was. And so as he studied Scripture, he, he began to note uh, some things that he found in Scripture. And I'm, I'm not going to try to give you chapter and verse. I'm just going to give you some ideas. You can look them up if you want to. Um, so the fact that Adam and Eve uh, discovered themselves to be naked and they were embarrassed. So for St. Augustine, there was something about 
uh, the physical human body, the nudity of the body, especially uh, male in relation to female, um, that that caught his attention there, and that made him think, oh, well, then maybe there's something to this, um, this this idea of this this physical body, and then. Um, Augustine remembered another scripture. Um, uh, it's, it's in Psalms, uh, where he talks about, uh, in sin I was conceived, uh, and in sin I was born. And so St. Augustine is, is, is grappling with this idea of, of everything falling down, declining, decaying uh, from its perfect state. And so St. Augustine begins to think about that, and he begins to, to talk about um, inherited sin. So we're all born with a sinful, fallen, decayed nature. Uh, we're all born with what Augustine calls original sin, or what's later called original sin. There's no way to escape that, according to Augustine. There is no way to, to not have that, at least as long as you're born. That is, born through sexual reproduction. So, for Augustine, original sin does not mean that you sinned. That's not where it comes from. It has to do with the fact that you were born. And why were you born? If you trace it back, everyone is born because of an egg and a sperm. And the most natural way that those get together? You guessed it. Your parents had sex. So the very fact that your parents had sex means then that you are conceived in sin and born in sin. And so for Augustine, that, that taint of sin, that, that, that decay um, that separates you from God, um, that decay then is what makes you a sinner. Uh, that's why you were born with sin. Now, this becomes important in Christian theology and understanding why Mary had to be a virgin. Um, because it's believed that it is the man that, um, that is really what gives uh, life. Uh, women were, were conceived in the ancient world as mere vessels of of. That, that carried the child. Um, uh, male semen, male ejaculate into the female, uh, put the seed in there. And all the woman does. They didn't understand the egg. They, they didn't understand sperm egg coming together. Uh, they thought it was just, just uh, the semen that, that put uh, the, the tiny little human uh, into the woman, and it's from there that the tiny little human would grow into a baby human, and the baby human would eventually be born and grow into a human human, a big human. Um, and so, in Christian theology, then, uh, the Virgin Mary is born of a virgin herself. Um, so, uh, Mary's parents are known as, uh, I believe it's Joachim and Anna. Uh, and Anna uh, conceived Mary. That is where the term immaculate conception comes from. Not Jesus' birth. Jesus' birth is referred to as the virgin birth. So, Mary is born in a pure state. Immaculately born. So that she then would be a pure, unsinful vessel, a vessel born without original sin. So she's not born through this sexual process of egg and sperm. 
Her mother conceived her and brought her into the world. She becomes this pure vessel waiting for God to inseminate her uh, with the Holy Spirit. So the scripture talks about the Holy Spirit over, uh, the angel says to, to Mary, uh, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and overshadow you and this thing that shall be conceived in you shall be holy. Um, and so Mary becomes then this pure vessel for the impregnation of the Holy Spirit uh, that grows into what the, the person we know of as Jesus and Jesus then is born also without this original sin. So Mary's born without original sin, so she can be the container. The Holy Spirit comes and puts the, 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 the fetal Jesus inside of this pure vessel. Mary carries it and nurtures it until he is born. He becomes Jesus. He grows up without sin. Again, this is, this is, this is Augustine theology. This is Catholic, Roman Catholic theology. Jesus grows up without sin, and then when he is killed then by the Romans, he becomes a perfect, spotless, sinless sacrifice that appeases God because finally, finally there has been a sinless human, and he makes that sacrifice. So in Augustine's theology, uh, original sin is important because it means that Jesus can be born without original sin. I know, it's complicated. Go back and watch this. Uh, in fact, I'll put up a couple of videos, um, YouTube videos. I'll try to find the shorter ones uh, for you to watch so that you can uh, have a sense of it. Uh, hold on just a second. I want to get a sense of the time here. Um, okay, um, so see what time it is. So we're good. Um, all right. Um, so um, that's a little bit about um, St. Augustine. There, there's so much more that we could really talk about with, with Augustine, but um, uh, we, we just, I'll give you a couple of readings from, uh, for Augustine. But let's move on. So Augustine is essentially straddling two worlds. Um, he's straddling the classical world, which is why his uh, philosophy, his theology is so influenced by Plato, uh, Neoplatonism, but he's also, um, literally, as he is dying uh, in the cathedral, um, as, he, as he lay dying, um, the barbarians are, are coming, the Germanic tribes are coming from the north, and they're overrunning um, uh, the Roman Empire. They're, they're just sacking everything. They're vandalizing everything. They're stealing everything. And one of the reasons why they don't attack the cathedral is because St. Augustine is in the cathedral and he's dying, and they, out of respect for this dying uh, holy man, uh, they don't attack the cathedral at this point. They allow him to die in peace. And so St. Augustine then has one foot, uh, excuse me, in the classical world, but he also then has a foot um, in what will eventually come uh, the Middle Ages, medieval uh, ages, uh, or the Dark Ages, uh, Medieval Times, Middle Ages, or the Dark Ages. It's dark only for the West. Uh, let's be clear about that. When we refer to the Dark Ages, um, that is a very uh, Western-centric uh, understanding of what was going on in the world at this time. Uh, the Eastern world it's not going to be dark. Um, Judaism, and eventually when Islam evolves, Judaism is going to continue. Islam is going to continue. Uh, if you go even further, uh, or uh, Islam is going to, to emerge uh, a, few, a couple of centuries later, uh, Judaism is going to continue. If you go even further east, you have Hinduism and, all, and, and Hindu philosophy that is emerging, developing, uh, and that culture. Uh, you have uh, cultures in Mongolia and China that are developing and emerging during this time. Uh, Buddhism uh, is developing in India and other parts of Asia during this time. And so if you go east, they don't understand. You know, if, if we talk to them about the Dark Ages, they wouldn't understand that. It's, it's a very Western-centric view uh, to talk about the Dark Ages. And so 
when we talk about St. Augustine having one foot in the classical world and one foot in the Dark Ages, uh, we mean that in a Western uh, sense, uh, he, is, he is straddling uh, those two worlds. Um, but um, the, the Roman Empire is being overrun uh, as Augustine, literally as Augustine is dying. Uh, and so, oh, don't know what happened there. My, my screen went blank for a second. Still recording. Um, and there are groups who continue to collect um, uh, all of the, the philosophy of the West. Uh, that threw me for a loop there when my screen went blank. Uh, they, they continue to collect all these philosophies of the West. Um, they're known as encyclopedist. Uh, and so what they're doing is they're collecting as much of this knowledge as they possibly can, uh, and they're... they're um, um, preserving it uh, anywhere that they can preserve it. Uh, one, of the, one of the ones that I'm, I'm most fond of um, is known as the Venerable Bede. Uh, he's an English historian uh, that tells much uh, of the, of the uh, early uh, English world. I, I'm just an Anglophile in that way. Um, then uh, there's a philosopher who, who I'll just mention just a little bit. Uh, he's not terribly important. Uh, uh, John Scotus. Um, uh, John's goal was to categorize everything um, and um, things that are and things that are not. Uh, again, you have to remember this line. Um, he's, he's a Neoplatonist in that sense. Uh, and so what is at the top up here? Um, the ultimate uh, things that, um, uh, that, that what is most real uh, for him what is most real is those things that, that you cannot see and cannot touch. Uh, so God is up there. Um, the forms uh, of chairness and such, uh, those are the, are, are the most real things. Uh, but he also believed that God was at the bottom because God then becomes the origin of everything. So not this um, Augustinian view of, of things decaying, but rather God then being the source of all things, and as they move up, uh, so God is, is intangible. God can't be touched. God can't be uh, seen. God can't be felt. And God is most real down here at the bottom. And then as you go up, things become physical, which become less real. And then things become less and less visible and less tangible until you get back to God. So God then becomes the source of all that is. And God begins, uh, becomes the end of all that is. And so really creating this... this uh, circle, if you will, uh, that God is the source and God is the end, God is the alpha, God is the omega, um, but it produces kind of a pantheism uh, that is going to be condemned uh, as heresy by the church. I'm not going to go there very much because he's not important. I want to get uh, quickly uh, to this last uh, philosopher that I want to talk about, uh, Anselm, Anselm of Canterbury, Canterbury being in England. By the way, there's another Augustine, Augustine of Canterbury, also a theologian philosopher, I think we'll see a little bit about him, not to be confused with Augustine of Hippo, who we've just been talking about. So Anselm of Canterbury. If you ever go to Canterbury, you can, you can uh, I believe, uh, if I remember correctly, I, I, his, his tomb is still there. I saw it last, last May. Uh, and so Anselm's greatest contribution to uh, philosophy, theology, uh, is his... Um, uh, uh, ontological argument, uh, ontological argument for the existence of God. Um, and so, ontology has to do with, with uh, the theory, theory of being, uh, that is, your, your, what, what is. Um, so, the theory of being, ontology. And so his ontological argument is an argument from being, uh, an argument from uh, the, the, the idea of existence. And so um, Anselm uh, used his jumping off place from a, from a scripture, uh, much like um, Augustine had done. Uh, it's, it's a psalm, and there is a psalm that says... Um, uh, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Uh, Anselm said, that's, that's a contradiction that can't exist. Because the very idea that you can say 
or understand God, to deny God is impossible. Um, so you, you really can't deny the existence of God. So Anselm then um, developed this, uh, this, this, ontolo this ontological argument. Here's a thought experiment. I want you to think the most perfect being you could possibly conceive. I don't know, what is it? A unicorn? Yeah, let's make it a unicorn. A flying unicorn. A flying pink unicorn. Let's make it that. Now, what would make that even better? Hmm. What can be better than a flying pink unicorn? I know if that flying pink unicorn actually existed. If there actually was a flying pink unicorn. So for Anselm, that, in essence, is the ontological argument. He said, God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. So for Anselm, the key to understanding this is you conceive of God. What would God be? God would be all-powerful. Uh, these are, these are the, 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 the traditional attributes for the divine being. All-powerful, all-knowing, um, all-present. Um, so these are, are some of the attributes of God. Unchanging, uh, immutable as, as it's called. Uh, so these would then be the attributes um, for, for, for some of the traditional attributes for God. But just because you conceive of, of, of all-knowing, all-powerful, um, uh, all-present, uh, omniscient, omnipotent, uh, uh, omnipresent, uh, immutable, uh, just because you conceive of those attributes and you say that that's God, that doesn't necessarily make it God unless God actually exists. So out of all those things that you can conceive, the only way to make it greater is if it actually is. And so for Anselm then, um, for, for you to be able to conceive it then means that, well, it must be possible because how else could you conceive it unless it is? You might begin to see the flaw in this. And in fact, uh, Anselm had someone who disagreed with him rather publicly, and he said, you know, Anselm, this is, this is really ridiculous. I can think of a perfect island. I can think of an island that is absolutely just perfect in every way. It's paradise. But number one, that doesn't mean that I know where that island is, and it doesn't mean that it actually exists. It doesn't, just because I can conceive of it, doesn't mean that it exists. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It just means that I can think of it. So the ontological argument has, has, has had its place um, through, through the centuries. Um, in, in fact, uh, and it's also had its critics through the centuries. One of the most recent critics of, of the ontological argument um, is um, a philosopher by the name of Richard Dawkins. Uh, and he wrote a book called The God Delusion. He's an avowed uh, atheist. And Richard Dawkins, uh, and I'm wrapping up my, my lecture here with this, Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion, uh, he takes on the argument from being. And one of the ways he, he takes it on, he said, just because you can conceive it doesn't mean that it's act actually true. And so just because you can think of God and you can uh, say that God is all these things doesn't mean that God necessarily exists. And so Dawkins then uh, posits the idea of a flying spaghetti monster. And he says, I can think of it. I can tell you the characteristics of it. But that doesn't mean that there's a flying spaghetti monster. Now, several people um, around the world, this is true, uh, several people have picked up on Dawkins' idea of a flying spaghetti monster, and they actually developed a religion 
Yeah, it's true. Look it up. They're Pastafarians. Um, and they wear colanders on their heads as their, as their uh, holy attire and things like that. Um, I'm going to post uh, something uh, for you to watch uh, on, on Richard Dawkins and the Flying Spaghetti Monster and things like that. So I hope uh, you've gotten something out of this first lecture. It's been about an hour and 10 minutes. Um, what I'm, as, as I explained earlier uh, in the first video, um, the supplemental material that I'll be sending to you or posting on Canvas uh, is also something that you need to view. Uh, and so I've, I've lectured without pausing. I've lectured without uh, having discussions or interruptions. So this hour and 10 minute lecture would ordinarily be a couple of hours uh, if we were in the actual classroom. I've also probably been talking a lot quicker and you didn't ask questions or anything like that. Uh, so you can go back and you can watch parts of this if you need to. Um, for that reason, I'm probably going to leave it up. Uh, I, I thought about taking it down, uh, but there will be a quiz that I will post one week from today. And your assignment will be to answer the questions in that quiz in Canvas uh, that are based on uh, the lecture that you've just been watching. Uh, the supplemental reading, it won't be long, but the supplemental reading, the reading from the chapter. Uh, and so for this lecture, uh, we've gone from uh, pages 117 up to 126. Um, so, um, yeah, let, let me be sure that's right. Yeah, one, 111 up to 126 uh, for this lecture today. So your assignment is to read that portion of the chapter. Uh, to read what I'm going to post from uh, uh, Augustine and Anselm, uh, and then to also watch the supplemental videos. There will be one about Augustine uh, and Original Sin. There will be one about Anselm, uh, and I'll probably put up one about uh, Richard Dawkins and the uh, Richard Dawkins and, and the God Delusion. So, uh, if you have any questions, uh, email me. Let me know. And um, next Monday. Uh, you'll have your discussion questions or, or your um, quiz questions. I should, I should back up and say, I'll post the discussion questions today, and there will be quiz questions that will be posted uh, later as well. Uh, the quiz is what you'll have to complete um, by next Monday when, when I post that to show me that you have covered all this material. Have any questions, email me uh, and let me know. All right? Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay at home. Um, Unless you don't have a computer at home and you have to go out to, to watch, which is why I'm going to email this to you as well. Of course, if I email it to you, it means you have a computer at home. But um, if you have to go out, uh, please be safe. Don't spend a lot of time outside. Uh, take, this, take this very seriously, uh, as I hope you are. All right. Have a good day.